So if I had to say that there was one symptom that stood out head and shoulders above the others for people that have neurological dysfunction, it would be fatigue. It's a constant conversation. It doesn't really seem to matter what type of neurological compromise we're able to find from a mechanistic perspective. They all seem to have this coalescence around the idea of fatigue. And sometimes this is even given the name neuro fatigue. It's that sense of like just not being able to have any get up and go. Your brain feels tired. Thinking feels tired, the moving feels tired, everything. That's the way a lot of people experience fatigue. And to me, that's reasonable because if you take something that's inefficient, right? So your brain is constantly trying to operate on efficiency. If you think about a computer, the more processing speed it has, the more energy it's gonna use up. And I don't know if any of you had these old computers. Like I had a computer back in the day that um, we used to download music and stuff. Hope it's past the statute of limitations on that and get just flooded with viruses and all sorts of nonsense. It would get so slow. So you'd have this computer that just gives you that pinwheel thing that just keeps going as it's thinking and thinking and thinking like it's got too many tabs open and then it would get super hot. And that's the way I kind of think about folks that are dealing with neurological compromise is that because we've lost efficiency in the way those cells can communicate, the way neurons fire, the brain has to try to make up for that by pumping more more and more energy into it to try to get the same job done. So, you know, you think of a task that would normally cost X amount of energy might now cost 3X amount of energy. And when that's the case, it just drains the battery so much faster. So I think of two cases today that we went through that kind of exhibited that. My name is Dr. Nathan Kaiser. I'm with the Kaiser Clinic in Chelsea, Michigan, and we help people with neurological dysfunction get better. The first case today that that, that came up and we were doing a check-in on someone, a little girl had a convergent spasm. If you don't know what that is, basically, no matter where you're looking, she had the experience that her eyes were kind of crossed, like she was looking at something close, the way they would do this. But hers were like that all the time, whether she was looking far or near and because of that you can imagine like how much extra effort that would take to be able to kind of fight off what would be two different images from either eyes so it takes just a ton of juice and that was one of her big complaints she couldn't play her sports she couldn't like hang in there at school and so we went through some things relative to that a lot of people think cool vision therapy we just do that and that's the way it goes but we found that she hadn't had success with that she tried that wasn't really that helpful for her we actually found an underlying disorder uh, relative to her her balance system System in, in her inner ear, in her central vestibular system. So anyway, we were able to localize it to that area. We did some exercises that target the vestibulocerebellum. So we train that area up and we find that that convergence spasm goes away. We see her brain start to operate more efficiently. So what does that mean? Not just like she sees better, which is super cool. She balances better. That's great too. But it means she doesn't have to waste all that energy just on seeing and balancing. And if she can do that, then it opens up a world. So she can go back to playing sports again, which is, I mean, how cool is that? And then being able to go to school and not like getting sick or feeling like you need to lay your head down or getting a headache, right? So very cool outcomes, but they, they boil down to this idea of energy and fatigue, where if we can just get that brain to function with a little more efficiency, we see those, those levels come up. And to think about that a different way, another case, different kind of problem, right? Where we had a drop in cerebral blood flow. So that change in cerebral perfusion, obviously, in this case, if we're not getting enough fuel to the brain, well, if you're not getting enough fuel in, that's kind of the source of energy. So you're going to see a decrease in the ability to be able to maintain activity if we can't get enough gas in the tank. So in this case, we actually were able to figure out on um, autonomic reflex testing. She just didn't have the normal cardiovascular responses to deep breathing. So that normal reflex that should loop in from baroreceptors to brainstem back to the heart didn't work. So we should have this nice curved line. Hers is flat. So it's not ideal. So we had to rebuild that from the beginning. Beginning. We worked with her, gave her some training tools to be able to retrain those autonomic reflexes. We started to get curves back and those deep breathing responses kicked back on. The easy, like the low hanging fruit of that that's great is now you have the ability to control cardiac reflexes, which means your heart doesn't have to like start baseline at 100 beats per minute. And then obviously, if that's true, then you're able to fill your heart with more blood. So the ejection fraction can go up, meaning you can pump more blood per beat of your heart, which makes it easier to pump it into your head and that allows you to have better cerebral perfusion. Fantastic because now we can actually get some blood flow to the head and that's got two benefits because the area that we're working on solving for 
right? Where the problem is, is within the brain. So if we can't fuel it, you can't do a lot of exercise. So you have to like start really small to be able to build those reflexes back up. But the secondary benefit is you get to have more blood to do more work. So we get an exponential sort of a response to that because you can get fuel to the brain. But if you look at these two cases, you realize like they're not the same thing. And in one case, you're looking at that brain is like just cranking out too hard, working too hard. And because of that, you're wasting energy. And then in another sense, because you're not able to get enough fuel to the brain, you just can't sustain or produce any activity. The lesson in that, hopefully, is that when we look at neurological dysfunction, number one, we can't just like assume we're going to have one or the other, or we're going to fail a large number of cases. But importantly, if we can figure out the mechanism behind it and try to back out and understand the machinery and what is going on here, then it gives us a bigger playbook of things that we can do to try to solve the problem. So these are just two ways that we saw that. But if you're someone that's, number one, if you've got a problem, problem with your brain, with your nervous system, it's not functioning well, there's a super high probability that it's going to lead to fatigue. To say like, if you're someone with fatigue, that fatigue is there for a reason. There's a, there's a commonality to why that's happening. And if you can understand it, you can get to the bottom of it. It makes that, that treatment process so much easier. I hope that helps. Again, leave us a message. If this is useful, like it, do all the things that people do. If we can help you, we'd love to try and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks.